So finding the best exercise for osteoporosis, it can be really challenging. There's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of fear out there. But recently, a patient showed me an article that I want to review with you today because I think it's pretty misleading. I want to show you why this particular recommendation should be taken with caution and discuss how we add this type of activity to our program for everyone regardless of age, but there has to be nuance taken into consideration. And I think people are missing one of the big pictures of this article and I think it's exposing them to some danger and I want to go through it with you today. But before I do that, I'm curious what exercises you found to be most beneficial for your bone health? What do you attribute your success to if you've seen it? Now, you guys probably know that I'm a big fan of resistance training. If you follow me on Instagram, you'll see my daily training regimen. I talk about what kind of exercise I'm doing and why I'm doing them. And we encourage our patients to do the same, but we need to meet them where they are. Now we have a program that we've built out that has different different tiers, starting with some very basic things and progressing to some pretty advanced things. So we have something we can do for everybody, but again, we have to meet them where they are. And this is where doing it on your own becomes really challenging. One of the areas where we've been hesitant to make blanket recommendations in the past is through the area of impact and training. We know clearly from the literature that while resistance training is king for muscle, king for metabolic health, king for longevity, impact, is required to build bone. However, impact training also carries with it the greatest risk. So what do we do? Well, like all topics, I pointed my research team at the studies that we can review to come up with some ideas of how we can guide our recommendations. This study that was pointed to me by a patient actually was something that we'd come up with before. We haven't presented on it yet. And I want to take this opportunity today because again, I think it's misleading. I think it might be pushing people to do things that they probably either physically able to do yet or maybe shouldn't do because of the condition that they're in. And it's pointing them down the wrong direction when there are better alternatives to consider. So here's the study. Now, this study is a meta-analysis, so this is a study that is essentially talking about other studies, and this study looks at six randomized control trials on the topic of jumping as a tool for improved bone mineral density. Now, the whole idea of jumping, let's just clearly define what this means, because it can mean a few different things, but in all six of these studies, what they're talking about here is literally coming from the ground, jumping into the air, and landing back on the ground either on two feet or on one feet. So that's the definition of jumping in all six of these studies. So the biggest takeaway from the study from most people, if they read the abstract, which is all that's available online, by the way, but if you read the abstract, it, what you will find is that they conclude that jumping will increase femoral neck bone mineral density. And for people that have low femoral neck or hip bone mineral density, this is pretty exciting, right? So they wanna improve their BMD. They look at this study, they're like, man, I'm gonna start adding jumping into my regimen. Now again, jumping by definition from the ground to the ground, and these were done either on two feet and they were done on one feet and different you know variables as far as how much and how often but let's just assume for this point that they're just jumping and it's going to be three days a week or six days a week or something like that the nice thing is about some kind of intervention like this is that there's no equipment it's totally free and for a lot of people that's really intriguing but as usual the details of the study matter. So listen up so you don't get misled by recommendations from somebody who either read this abstract online or they've added this in their program and they think that it's right for you because there, again, is nuance in this that you really need to understand. But before we get there, if you're struggling to put together your own bone health program, please consider joining our free bone health masterclass. That masterclass is run every one to two weeks. I lead it myself. It's totally free. And we have about 45 minutes to go through how we build a program and leave about 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. Thousands of people have found this to be really helpful and it's something that I hope you join us for if you're again having issues putting together your own bone health program. Okay, so here are the details of the study that you must know. First, the title of the study kind of gives away one of the most important thing that people are ignoring in this study. And the title clearly states that this study on studies is on premenopausal women. So obviously this is indicating a relatively younger population, of course, depending on your starting point. And so I took a look at all six of these studies in the meta-analysis. And again, some of these are tricky to find and get access to, but I was able to get access to look at the methods of all of these studies. And indeed, if you look at the, the recruitment, inclusion and exclusion criteria, they were all, except for one, all premenopausal women and the average age was probably somewhere around the mid thirties, if you were to put them all together. So here's the rub. People will say, well, does that mean that it won't work for postmenopausal women? And the answer is, well, maybe. But there's two things to consider here. 
One is we shouldn't extrapolate from one population to another. We know that postmenopausal women are different than premenopausal women in a few ways. So number one, there could be a hormone differentiation. In general, as we age, this has nothing to do with menopause, but since simply as we age, we are going to lose, as both men and women, we're gonna lose muscle mass. We're gonna lose explosive strength the ability to get up off the ground, we're going to lose tolerance to dynamic exercise in general, right? You don't see as many older individuals doing dynamic plyometric like exercises, that explosive type exercise, because there are potential consequences. And we may have joint pain that's inhibiting force generation. I was actually just thinking recently, I've, I've sort of let all of that go. And I should probably add some of that back. Um, but you just generally don't see an older population doing that. And I think there is, there's a lot of reasons why, but that might be why if you recruited a population of say women in their sixties, seventies, and eighties to do this type of exercise, you would probably not see the same impact. Now, one of the studies really clearly shows this difference because they actually compared premenopausal women to postmenopausal women. And it was really cool because they literally found that in the premenopausal group, there was a statistically significant improvement in bone mineral density, but in the postmenopausal group, there was not. So while this was only one study, I think this just goes to show that an explosive type action to try to build bone mineral density is probably not going to be extrapolated from a younger population to an older population with some exception, but I would work into that very gradually. And I would recommend not exposing yourself to something that has as much risk as jumping up and down multiple times a day, every day, because there are other options. It is always a risk benefit analysis for all interventions. And that's activity, exercise, supplements, hormone replacement, and even drugs. So what do we do? Well, we do now have an impact program in our program and we use gravity more so than jumping. And we use less dynamic exercises to facilitate that kind of impact. Some of these studies actually pointed out how much impact you could generate with just jumping up and down. And they pointed to around three multiples of body weight, which is pretty good. Um, and so you can still get though that three multiples of body weight by doing something like a heel drop. And I did a previous video on this. You could also do things like box jump. So you're up on something and jumping off again, of course, be careful. And then there's simulated impact like osteostrong, bio density, whole body vibration. We have videos on all those things in in those types of devices, you're actually simulating impact rather than like provoking the actual impact, which is gonna put you at higher risk. So for me, the takeaway from this study is not so much that my older patients shouldn't use jumping exercises, while that is potentially true for, the, for most of them, but what I really like about this study is that it shows that if you are a younger individual with osteoporosis, especially if you are young and concerned about your bone health, that something as simple as jumping jumping up and down 10 times a day, six days a week, those simple kinds of things can really improve your bone mineral density, especially if you have the capacity to improve bone rapidly like you would in, let's say, early middle adolescence, probably even early adulthood. So I think that there's really something to take away from this study. And if we can encourage and counsel our younger friends, colleagues, potentially children or grandchildren, depending on your starting point, that if they're concerned about bone, if they have a family history of osteoporosis, if they have other risk, risk factors for osteoporosis, they may want to consider incorporating something like this if it is safe for them to do so. All right, so I hope that made sense and I hope you can now see how this may or may not work into your own regimen on activity for bone health. If you want to consider watching a video on heel drops, I've got that video here, or whole body vibration. This is a series, this is the, the third in a series of three on whole body vibration that you you may want to consider here. Let us know what else you would like to see in these videos. We have a, a very, very long list, but we're happy to move stuff up to the top and we're going to continue putting these out as frequently as we can because remember that osteoporosis isn't the end, but deciding to reverse it is a beginning. I'll see you in the next video.